Touch down on the astral plane with a starstruck boy and promise like a ball and chain. Tired and weary and a little forlorn, I was hoping to find myself reborn, reborn. And something was lost. So easily explained. You dream of colors, and I dream of gold. You dream of summers, but my dreams leave me cold. I thought I knew just what I wanted, but now it seems that dreams are coming. Bit haunted. Something was lost and gained, but nothing's always a How you doing today? So, I've made it to Laramie, Wyoming, where I've always wanted to come here. And now I'm finally here, which is very surreal. Really, really surreal. And I'm here to do, um, talk about Matthew Shepard. Now, if his name isn't familiar to you, I'm gonna give you the background of Matthew's life and what happened to him and take you to a few of the places here in Laramie that have to do with Matthew Shepard. And here I am on the University of Wyoming campus and this is where he was going to school in uh, October of 1998. So 21 years ago. This campus, it's a beautiful campus. Let me show you around a bit. So as you can see, there's people biking to class, walking to class. Not too many people on the campus walking around. I mean, it is November, it's cold. So I guess there, most people know to walk fast, get to class, stay inside. Not only did I always want to come to uh, Laramie because of Matthew Shepard, I've always wanted to come to Wyoming. It's a state that I've never visited, and I got in late last night. Here, I'll show you the drive into Laramie. Okay. Not to jump ahead, but that's kind of the view that Matthew would have had on the last night of his life. But and so it was a long drive to Laramie from where I was. And then it was, um, not only was it a long drive, I couldn't sleep. I was thinking about how I'm gonna do this video and how I'm gonna put it together. So I'm gonna do my best to tell you about Matthew Shepard. And yeah, I'm just gonna kinda go through it. And I'll start quickly with uh, Matthew was a young gay man and going to school here in Wyoming. Now, as a teenager, he went to school in Saudi Arabia. Well, he went, his family moved to Saudi Arabia, but he went to a boarding school in Switzerland. And I'm gonna, I mean, Matthew was a very popular, very friendly, friendly boy and teenager. And then when he was in Switzerland, he went on a school trip to Morocco where he was brutally attacked and raped, gang raped. I'm sorry, these details are horrific. 
when he was 15 years old. And a lot of his friends and family say that changed him and that made him a different person. Depression, suicidal, um, I mean, I, I'm obvious, I, I just, when I was re, I've, I've known the details for a long time and then rereading everything about Matthew last night, that part was really just horrible. I, that's a good change anyone, obviously. So then he came back to the States after a certain amount of time and he enrolled here at the University of Wyoming. And he was here on the campus in October of 1998 for, uh, I'm not sure what it was, for some sort of uh, meeting. And he wanted to go out afterwards and asked some people to go out with him. And they said, you know, other people had other plans. So he decided to go into town, into Laramie for a drink at a bar. I'm going to take you to that bar right now. We're going to go. I'm going to show you it, what it looks like today. Okay. Sun's coming out. And it's true what they say. It's wide open skies here. Wow. I drove... This is... Uh, downtown Laramie. It's a really short drive from the university. I was very, very surprised. So it would have been a short walk from uh, the university to the bar here for Matthew that night. And uh, I was here when I got in town last night. I drove right here first just to take a look. And I filmed some video up and down this street here. And I'll show you what, uh, this is second street. And I'll show you how desolate and quiet it is at night. Take a look at this. So yeah, it's pretty quiet at night around here. I had no clue that I was that close to the university either. On October 6, 1998, Matthew went to this bar here. I had a drink, sat at the bar, and he was a friendly guy, like I've said before. I, I believe from all that I've read that he did have ups and downs with depression. He could go into a deep depression for a few days and disappear but it seems like he was in a good mood that night and walking around talking to other patrons and then two men entered the bar and I was you know what I'm not gonna say their names I was just about to um, I don't need to two guys came into this bar sat down and ordered a pitcher of beer and they paid for it with dimes and nickels it says a great deal about them right there type of person, people they were. That's a dick move. That's just being a dick. Now, here's where the story gets a little convoluted. Now, apparently they noticed Matthew at the bar. They thought, he looks like an easy target. And they went into the restroom and hatched a plan to rob him. Now, where it's convoluted is how Matthew left the bar with them. Apparently, some say they, they left together, some say he followed them out, some say they were talking in the bar. Regardless, they left, and Matthew went with them. Now, another part of the story that gets very uh, convoluted and tricky is, because even the prosecutor has said afterwards, it was a simple robbery that turned to murder. Didn't say it was a hate crime. Now, they, and his girlfriend, one of the killer's girlfriends said that he, the main killer, although they both are guilty of it, obviously, said that he had real anger toward homosexuals. So, apparently they got into the truck, and then he said that Matthew touched his leg and that threw him into a rage. That's the gay panic defense right there. 
doesn't hold up. It's not a defense. And while one of them was driving, the other one, the main one, uh, Aaron is his name, began to pistol whip Matthew in the car, in the truck as they were driving. And they took him to the outskirts of town. I'm gonna to take you there. First, I'm gonna show you inside the bar really quickly. It's not something I think they would like to um, remember. I'm just gonna show you from the inside doorway show you what it looks like inside and I'll show you a little bit about what the bar looks like now and how it looked back when Matthew came here. So let's just make one thing clear. Well, two things clear. I mean, I'm giving the basic story. You can read extensively about it online. There's plenty of documentaries and movies. The Laramie Project, the most famous one, made about Matthew Shepard in this case and what happened to him. But uh, I'm just going through it from what I remember. I remember back when it happened and the outrage and the, and the pain and the grief that uh, his family and friends felt and everybody felt make no mistake it was a hate crime they did they what they did to Matthew how severely he was beaten that's not a robbery that's hatred that's anger there's no there's no two ways about that this was a hate crime it was because Matthew was gay. And Matthew was small. He was tiny. That's, I think when I first heard the story and saw the pictures and read about it years ago, that's what struck me the most. And that's what affected me the most and made me not forget this case. Because how small he was. And it just, and these two assholes picking on someone that's what angered that's really what got it I hate bullies I can't stand them and that's exactly I mean they're a level up from the typical bully many levels up I guess but that's what really angered me about it picking on someone that small and I hope where they are right now they're both in prison I hope they get picked on every day. Now I'm gonna take you, and more than picked on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you now to where they took Matthew and show you what it looks like today. It's a bit of a drive outside of town. I'm gonna to tell you what happened to Matthew out there. So even with a windsock, it's really, really windy. And uh, it's just a little tiny windsock I put and it's not doing anything. So I'm just gonna tell the rest of the story before I get out and do something here. Um, so it's about a nine to 10 minute drive. That must've been the most horrible nine to 10 minutes anybody could ever be subjected to in that truck. So while Russell drove, uh, Aaron was repeatedly beating Matthew. They got out here and these are all new houses around here, but this is, I, from what I gather, was a very um, desolate area at the time. They robbed Matthew of $20 and his shoes and they tied him to a buck fence right there 
right out this window here. I'll try to show you a bit. Clear right out there. And that's pointing towards Laramie. Laramie is right that way. Now, they beat him so severely and left him tied to the fence for 18 hours until he was found. So the night, the day. And it's cold out right now. To imagine how cold he was, not to mention the extreme pain. It's unimaginable. But a jogger came along and found Matthew a cyclist, sorry, a cyclist came along and found Matthew. And at first he thought it was a scarecrow. That says, uh, hanging from a fence. So he called the police, the police came out. Now the police had already caught up with uh, Aaron and Russell because they got into a fight with two people back in Laramie. And they found Matthew's uh, shoes, they found a bloody gun. And I believe they found his wallet as well. So when the police came out here, they kind of put two and two together, figured out what was going on. And uh, the police officer who was first on the scene said that his face, and this is awful, his face was caked in blood, but there was two marks that were clear from all of his crying. Um, So, this was a famous case, and it still is, and it's important, and it's important to remember, because, well, how did, how did people get to that point where they want to do something that to another person, and especially because they're different than them, they're not the same, but I believe we all are the same anyway, but they tortured and beat Matthew and his parents were still in Saudi Arabia and they had to come all the way back and they didn't know what was going on at first they thought he would have had a car accident that was what they were under the impression and they were told differently what happened and then they got back here and I mean for parents to lose their child in any way is terrible but in this way it's absolutely horrible Matthew hung on for six days until he passed away in the hospital his be his beating was so severe like he I, I think it was in the back of his head uh, and that's where you he controls your like breathing heart rate he wouldn't have made it like he would have been in a comatose state the rest of his life After the murder, I can get into what happened to the two guys. They blamed each other. Uh, the one guy, Aaron, who did most of the, the beating, he used a lot of uh, homophobic slurs in his confession. It was a hate crime. Now, Russell has since, Russell's only in medium security now, and he said that it wasn't, that they just wanted to rob him. Who knows, He's, he, wants, he, does, he wants to get out. I think he wants to, doesn't want to be painted as, uh, he wants to, I, some people have said that he's changed in prison that, and I've read interviews with him. I mean, he seems remorseful, seems like he's changed, but he could have stopped it that night and he said he wasn't in a position to stop it. He was a follower. Oh, okay, dude. Aaron's never getting out, thankfully. But what happened afterwards, in the aftermath of this uh, horrific crime, was it brought so much attention uh, to Laramie and to uh, to hate crimes and to homophobia. Now, at Matthew's funeral, it was huge. And, of course, the Westboro Baptist Church, my old friends, they showed up. I say my old friends, I mean, um, I did a video about them and I went and spent the afternoon, a few minutes uh, 
at one point, like an hour with Shirley Phelps Roper, who was at one point the head of the uh, Westboro Baptist Church. That video's here on my channel. And I went out there expecting to hate and argue and yell and scream, and it became something quite different because Shirley is actually very um, easy to get along with. So is the, fam the rest of the family that I met. Now, that doesn't excuse their views, which are terrible, and I despise them. But I see a little glimmer in Shirley's eyes. I haven't spoken about this since I uh, did the uh, interview with her last year. I did see a little glimmer in her eyes of, um, I don't know, there's something behind her cold, dead shark eyes that the whole family has that I, I feel like there's still possibility for her to change, for her to uh, reject hate and embrace love. I think, I don't know. But they showed up with their usual signs, you know, God hates fags, that sort of thing. Made it a very difficult for his for Matthew's family and friends, and the, but that's what the Westboro Baptist Church does. Back then, it was a little more shocking. Now it's more like a sideshow, and just they're ridiculous, and nobody pays, nobody should pay attention to them. They don't know what they're talking about. They're brainwashed. They're a cult. Okay, and surely, if you ever watch this, even though I've kept in touch with you, you know what I how I feel. Just reject your family. Surely, do it. So I'm gonna go out in into the windy, into the cold, windy, Wyoming open space here. There, where the fence was, somebody put a, some stones with an arrow into, made it into an arrow, pointing back towards Laramie, right by the fence where it used to be, like this. I'll show you the picture. And I'm gonna put one back here because it's gone now. Uh, if you've seen any of my cemetery videos, I like to leave a stone at each grave to let people know that I have uh, let, it, it's a Jewish tradition letting someone know that you've been there and to keep the souls underground. It's People ask me all the time why I leave stones at graves and that's why. Um, but this time I'm gonna leave a lot of stones in the same arrow pointing towards Laramie as a little memorial to Matthew. I just don't, I, I had so much time to think while I was driving here and driving around last night, thinking about why people do these things and why, why these things happen. I mean, how, like for people to do something, how, how strong are you? Like, how much strength do you have to carry that much hate? To carry it around with you? Just because of somebody's sexual identity, their gender identity, their race. I've done videos about Brandon Tina, Emmett Till, and now uh, Matthew Shepard. And it's always about people being chosen because of who they are. Not because of something they've done. There's a Matthew Shepard hate crime law that President Obama signed into, uh, into law. And essentially what it does is it makes hate crimes more visible and I, I from what I gather because hate crimes only protected if somebody was voting or on school out of school or doing something something that um was federally protected and now it makes it a hate crime if it happens anywhere that's the gist of the Matthew Shepard hate crime law there could be, I believe there is more to it but that's essentially what it is it protects people I hope I've told Matthew's story right the best of my knowledge um, I think I have. I don't know. I've talked for a long time in the car because it's so windy out. Uh, let's put the rocks down for Matthew. And then I'm going to drive around Wyoming because it's beautiful. And I want to see more of it. 
And Laramie, everybody who's driven by me has smiled. Everybody that has given me nods. Laramie is not the town that killed Matthew Shepard. Two guys here killed Matthew Shepard. Although, I hope So yeah, let's put the rocks down now for Matthew. I'll put them right on here. We touched down on the astral plane with a starstruck boy and promised like a ball and chain. Tired and weary and a little forlorn I was hoping to find myself reborn, reborn And something was lost and gained But nothing so easily explained dream of colors and I dream of gold You dream of summers but my dreams will leave me cold I thought I knew just what I wanted But now it seems that dreams have come a little bit haunted Something was lost in So easily explained. It turns you inside out, fills your heart with doubt. Nothing is for certain. But I tell.
a ticket and nobody knows your name At first it felt like a twilight zone But with every new day it seems a little more like 